Ready? Okay. Welcome, everyone. It is May, sorry, May. Uh, January the 12th at 6.01 p.m. Uh, we're going to call this meeting to order. Uh, can I ask uh, Councilwoman Portia Middleton to lead us in the flag salute? Please rise. really nice to hear those young voices out there good job okay may I have the next item oh can I uh, can I ask you to call the roll please sure council members Karpinski Costa present council member Lopez Taff here council member Middleton here vice mayor Daniels here and mayor Schaefer here next item please this meeting of the Citrus Heights City Council is cablecast live on Metro Cable 14, the local government affairs channel on the Comcast Consolidated Communications and AT&T U-verse cable systems. This meeting is closed captioned and live streamed at citrusheights.net. Tonight's meeting replays on Monday, January 16th at 9 a.m. on Channel 14. This meeting can also be viewed um, at the city's YouTube channel. Item, please. Next item is approval of agenda. Move approval. Second. I have approval by Daniel, second by Milton. You have a, a we need a roll call vote for that. Just uh, all in favor? Mm -hmm. Aye. 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 All right, motion passes. Thank you. Next item. Next item is presentation number four recognition of outgoing mayor. All right. Well, uh, Mayor, it was an exciting well, former Councilwoman Port Pendleton. It was a great year last year. We had a really, it was a really phenomenal year. Uh, and I just want to uh, personally thank you. Um, and I guess I should first ask for uh, comments from the council on this item. I, I, have, I have no comment. <laughs> We're just going to jump in. Jane? Anything? Well, as an observer, I just thought you had a very, very good year. Meetings were well run and uh, really enjoyed seeing you in the community all year long. Thank you. Uh, uh, definitely thank you for your hard work, uh, your uh, enthusiasm and all that. Uh, it was a, a big year because of coming out of COVID and, and all the things that happened with that. Lots of things going on and uh, greatly appreciate you staying up on them and representing us uh, uh, locally, regionally, you know, statewide. Um, I don't know if you got any national in there during that time, but uh, uh, thank you for doing all those things. Greatly appreciated. Thank you. And uh, same here. I just, I, I, you did a great job last year. Um, it was, it, it, becoming mayor, I'm just learning, is, uh, has some challenges to it, for sure. Uh, but uh, great job. Thank you. So uh, with that, I would like to uh, present to you with this beautiful gavel. Oh, oh my gosh. Look at that. <laughs> oh. Isn't that cool? And Mayor, if I may make a couple comments. Absolutely. Um, it was a tremendous honor and I'm deeply humbled to have served as your mayor and very excited to pass that gavel on because the responsibilities are, are tremendous and it's heavy and it's not an easy job. I, I enjoyed every moment of it. I wouldn't trade it for anything else and I'm very thankful for all the support that I got from the community, being out there, talking to you all and just being engaged. And I hope that we will all continue to be engaged coming even further out of COVID. Very good. Okay, with that, can I have the next item, please? The next item is presentation number five, presentation by Republic Services on the Poster Contest Awards. Okay. 
Good evening, Mayor Schaefer and council members. I am Brandon Caldway, and this is my colleague Ray Robinson with Republic Services. Tonight, we would like to present the Citrus Heights and Republic Services annual poster contest and recognize the student winners who have submitted some great exceptional artwork regarding the contest around recycling. Now, before I go over or announce the student winners, I'd like to do a quick introduction of what the contest is. And then after that, I'd like to ask you, Mayor Schaefer, if you'd be willing to step down to get an individual picture with each student. Absolutely. At the end of the uh, contest, I would also like to ask the council members if they would also be willing to step down to get a group picture with the students. Okay, so the poster contest is hosted by Republic Services in partnership with the San Juan Unified School District, Citrus Heights Schools, teachers, and students. This poster contest is for the students in the San Juan Unified School District attending Citrus Heights schools or living in Citrus Heights. We offer this poster contest to students in grades K through eight. Now part of this contest is to get the students thinking about conscientious recycling, to get them to think about the positive effects of proper recycling and the negative effects of not properly recycling. This year's contest, we had eight schools participate, including elementary schools, middle schools, and K through eight schools. Tonight, we would like to recognize 12 winners, including one grand prize winner. The grand prize winner will have their artwork featured twice in the 2023 Annual Customer Service Guide. We would also like to recognize the school with the most participation. Now this year's prompt was, what does recycling look like to you? We had a lot of exceptional uh, artwork coming in uh, that the students had submitted regarding what it looked like to them. And it was very unique uh, regarding all the different demographics that we have in this city and how the uh, recycling plays a role in their life. So before I go ahead and announce the student winners, Mayor Schaefer, would you like to step down, please? Absolutely. While he's stepping down, can I ask a question? Yes. How many uh, students, part how many entries did you get out of the 12 you picked? We had close to 200 uh, students participate this year. Okay, so we have two winners from Grand Oaks Elementary. Romina in first grade, would you please come up if you're here? Next, we have Sarahi, third grade. She may not have been able to make it. Okay, next we have one winner from Kingswood K through eight. Gracie K in second grade. Our next winner is from Lycan K through eight, Taryn, first grade. We have two winners from Sylvan Middle School. First winner, Milana S. in seventh grade. Okay, if you could stand. 
Uh, I think we want to do one more individual. Yeah. Come on up. Our next winner from Sylvan Middle School, we have Alessandra A, eighth grade. From Carriage Elementary, we have one winner, Alzale W in fifth grade. My apologies. We have one winner from Mariposa Avenue Elementary, Anastasia in third grade. From Skycrest Elementary School, one winner, Anna B in fifth grade. From Woodside K through eight, we have three winners. First up, Jocelyn M in fourth grade. There we go. Our next winner, Antoinette in seventh grade. And our grand prize winner, Milana L, fifth grade. And the school with the most participation this year is Woodside K through eight. I just want to again thank the Citrus Heights City Council and city staff for all the judging the San Juan Unified School District and participating schools for all of their help in coordinating these efforts and getting participation from the students. And at this time, I would like to invite the council members down to the front of the dais to get a group photo.
We're done, and you're more than welcome to head on out. Thank you guys very much. All right, next item, please. Next item is comments by council members and regional board updates. Uh, council member, um, Councilwoman Middleton, can we start with you? All right, absolutely, I'll kick this off. Today is a very, very special day. Today is my mother's birthday. <laughs> so. I just want to say happy birthday mom you're the most amazing person I know I'm not just saying that because you're my mother and I'm your only child and I know you're watching <laughs> okay how about um, Jana Karpinski Costa Dr. Jana Karpinski Costa well, I, I haven't had any report but I just wanted to mention the calendars how good these students did and how tough it must have been whoever had to judge these pictures because they're incredible and to remind the, the students that the Sacciolo Mosquito Vector Control District also has a calendar contest for fight the bite and if your school participates I think they get a cash award for the classroom so um, look into that one too but other than that I have nothing to report as yet great uh, council member Taft Thank you so much, Mayor. I uh, just want to wish everyone a happy new year. What a wonderful uh, year it is to start um, with you. And I, I too have a few comments about the poster contest. My, my daughter was um, a student at Woodside K-8 and they do have quite a robust um, participation program for the art contest. So she was one of the featured winners at one year and, and I'm just so proud for that continuing um, participation from the school, but uh, I have yet to participate in other committees and boards, so thank you. Great. Vice Mayor Daniels. Thank you. I uh, actually had a uh, regional board meeting for sanitation and sewer districts. Um, elected a new chair, David Sander from Rancho Cordova, and a new vice chair, Pat Hume, the new um, uh, supervisor on the board of supervisors. Uh, the, the main thing I think that came out of uh, both meetings, uh, well there was two meetings actually since our last uh, council meeting, um, was that um, we are moving forward with, if I understood this all right, this presentation with a world-class botanical garden, um, this, not the district, a partnership with an outside uh, organization to build a world-class botanical garden adjacent to uh, one of the facilities down in the South Sacramento area. So something that'll be coming to uh, Sacramento um, and it'll use an area that would otherwise not be usable um, and uh, something that continues to uh, put us on the map. And then the other thing was just further discussions and uh, a, a deeper dive into all of the things that are going to occur as they merge the sanitation district and the sewer district. Um, big task, uh, but a, a very logical one um, and a, a lot of work going into that spread out, I think over a couple of years to actually get it done. So. A lot of stuff there. On the other end, I had the uh, pleasure to uh, meet with the city manager um, and, uh, and have lunch together and discuss things uh, in a further way. And I bring that up because I just want to say how extremely lucky we are to have you, Ash. Um, um, the insight, the enthusiasm, uh, just uh, where we're going. Uh, uh, when, I, when I talk to our city manager, um, it's just, it's remarkable. It's remarkable, and uh, we are so blessed to have you. Thank you. Um, I met with the uh, Register of Voters, Registrar of Voters, with uh, the mayor and uh, Supervisor Sue Frost. Was it yesterday or the day before? It was yesterday. It was yesterday. <laughs> um, uh, we had a great tour. Are you going to speak on that a little bit more at all? I will yeah. speak a little bit. Um, but uh, a very, you know, very uh, modern, updated, uh, incredible process to the election and uh, they ran us through everything that goes on during the election they listened to us and our some of our concerns um, about making people um, uh, more confident in the integrity of elections 
Um, and hopefully we'll see some changes out of that. Uh, who knows? Uh, but, uh, you know, the, we kind of got the uh, rundown on, on how, why things slow down during, after election night and, and take uh, way too long, way too long to decide. Um, and hopefully we'll see some change in that in the, in the uh, future. Um, I just want to also wish, uh, wish Mama G a happy birthday. Um, one of my favorite people, and uh, she loves me with all her heart, so I, I just want to make sure she knows. For the most part. Yeah, <laughs> that uh, I wish her a happy birthday. And then I also want to wish uh, my little princess a happy birthday. She turns 40 tomorrow. <laughs> and so um, she's my special child, my special princess, and happy birthday, Stephanie. <laughs> i got to keep them straight. Happy birthday, Stephanie. Well, thank you. So uh, I had a, a uh, I've had two library board meetings. I had one on the fifteenth of December, uh, and that was just really kind of finishing up the year with some housekeeping business. Uh, the library board is in very good financial shape. Uh, I'm uh, happy to report. Um, I uh, uh, so in that respect. Uh, so then, this library board we had we met today, um, and we um, we. Um, posted a new um, a chair, and that is uh, Sue Frost. Uh, Supervisor Sue Frost is now the chair of the library board. Um, she was a chair when I first came onto the board, and she did a phenomenal job. I do want to uh, send a shout out to um, Garrett Gatewood, who was the outgoing chair, who also did a phenomenal job. So, um, And then uh, I also, just to elaborate on the Registrar of Orders tour, um, very comprehensive, uh, very impressive. Um, one of the things that I took out of the, this tour was um, I, I re sort of reminded them when we had polling places and you ran your ballot through the tabulation machine at the polling place, uh, how quickly the results came back. Um, and, uh, well, we can thank our state legislature for fixing that for us. Um, because now it's, we, we don't do that anymore. We now are, that's all tabulated at the Registrar of Voters office, so uh, get ready, folks. It's just going to take longer. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it seems like that's the new normal. There were some suggestions that I made. Uh, I had some concerns about the estimates of um, ballot processing, and they were very receptive to my suggestions with regard to how they can be a, a little more accurate on, because uh, it, uh, two weeks after the after the election was over, there was a they reestimated how many votes they had to still left to count. It was an additional eighty nine thousand, uh, which is a lot. Twenty one percent of the total was uh, came within the last two weeks. But they weren't they didn't appear from anywhere. It was simply a flawed estimate on uh, how they estimated. So I suggested they weigh a ballot and then weigh all the bags and figure out how many ballots there were. Uh, to a much more accurate level, and they were very receptive to that um, to that that point. Uh, in return for that, uh, what they asked is part of the reasons in Citrus Heights um, of all of the cities in the whole region. Um, it's the more in-person uh, ballot or ballots get deposited in Citrus Heights than any other city, and. Elk Grove is second, and Elk Grove is nearly double the size of Citrus Heights. So, uh, but that does present a problem for the registrar of voters. It takes a lot longer to tabulate those votes uh, because then now they have to cut them open and strip them, flatten them, and all the whole processing just takes a lot longer when they get the ballots on. So uh, we agreed, and, I, and I, I get this, I trust their process. I understand what their process is a lot better now, and so I would certainly recommend that you vote early. Um, otherwise, we're going to, the, the more votes they have to tabulate on, the, on election day, the longer it's going to take to finish the election. So uh, with regard to that. Um, Can I ask a question, Tim? So if you vote early, do they let it, do they start pulling them out of the envelopes and checking the signatures yes, they, prior they won't to election release night? Any, they won't release any of the results, but they will Flatten process and count the votes uh, as, they're, as they receive the votes. Okay. They won't wait till the last minute and open all the envelopes. So, any other questions? Okay. So um, with that, I do want to take a minute to recognize 
all the really hard work that our general services, and thank you for your leadership, uh, Director Cabe, is, did a phenomenal job. They had people, most people don't realize, we had people around the clock with the city taking care of the emergencies that happened, and I can't tell you how proud I am of the work that they did. Um, it was phenomenal, so thank you very much. Uh, unfortunately, it's not over yet. Um, you probably, I'm sure a lot of you encountered some damage. Fortunately, at my home, the damage was absolutely minimal, um, but I did drive around the city. I saw one home on Pratt Avenue where the tree had fallen and part of the tree roots were underneath the driveway and it lifted the entire slab of the driveway up over the, uh, so it was like a 30 degree angle. So that's unfortunate that, that, uh, that they suffered that kind of damage. So just be safe, try to, you know, put things away and, and uh, so that, uh, unfortunately, a lot of my stuff blew into my neighbor's yard and I received uh, uh, some product from my, my neighbors. It seems like all the wind was blowing east to west. And so I received product from my neighbors to the, to the east and my neighbor on the other side. Of all things, my pool pole where I where used to scoop out the leaves, that blew over the fence. And that's a that takes some doing. So um, it's pretty amazing uh, this this weather we've had. So uh, that's all I have. So we'll move on to the next item, please. But, but Ash saw a chicken flying through the air, <laughs> <laughs> landed on his feet, and then crossed the road. Right. Okay. It actually used a crosswalk. <laughs> no, that's that's a real story. All right, moving along. I have the next item, please. The next item is public comment and members of the public may address the council on any agenda item of interest to the public and within the council's purview or on any agenda item before or during the council's consideration of the item. Speakers will be limited to five minutes each. If you wish to address the council during the meeting, please either complete a speaker identification sheet and give it to myself. If participating via Zoom, use the raise hand function or star nine from a telephone to indicate your desire to speak. When your name is called, um, please state your name for the record, and if on Zoom, I will allow you to unmute your microphone to speak. Thank you. And I have, currently I have six speaker cards. It's not too late to fill out a speaker card if you have something, something you'd like to share. I do want to read a quick statement about um, public speaking and, and uh, speaking from the podium. Um, for people who wish to make a comment, please feel welcome and don't be nervous. We're all friendly. We're all neighbors here. Uh, and, consider, and we're a considerate group and all of us have been at the podium at one time or another. If you're speaking about a non, uh, an agenda item or a non-agenda item, you will have five minutes to, to make your comment. But please understand the Brown Act, which is what dictates what we can, how we conduct business up here, pro prohibits council members from actually addressing you or answering your questions. We're not permitted to discuss anything. This is not a discussion time. You can come up and make your comment and we'll listen, but uh, there will be no interaction between the council members and you. Uh, so with that, I will call the first uh, speaker and that is Rhett Reese. Thank you, Mayor and City Council members for the privilege to speak tonight. <clears throat> As a homeowner for over 20 years in the city of Citrus Heights, I've been very, a very proud resident of Citrus Heights. I have seen its ups and some of its downs. I'm very thankful to the men and women of law enforcement, fire, and public services, even animal control. I know that the current administration is working hard to approve the city, and I know it takes time. So at this time, I would like to bring to the council the attention of the dire need to repave San Juan Avenue between Madison and Greenback, as well as Dewey between Madison and Greenback. I have seen some of the work done on Dewey, but it does seem like it's incomplete. I realize that it usually one would s submit a pic, a picture, and uh, to the uh, the city and they would come out and do a patch and they do for the pot potholes and they do it very efficiently. I have seen that uh, with the others that have submitted those pictures and had uh, requested for patches, but I do believe that 
um, green uh, San Juan is in a shape that it needs a full repave, at least the majority near Madison Avenue. Um, so I'm hoping that some of the funds might be able to be reviewed and allocated towards San Juan repaving as well as the parts of Dewey that have not been. They are getting beyond patching. Also, I appreciate the uh, community enforcement and I'm hoping that they will be um, up and coming or be reallocated to do more of that. I would like to see that on my current street as I do see many unregistered vehicles and some people parking their vehicles on their yards. So uh, I do a thank you very much for your time and uh, allowing me to present this grievance. And I thank you for dedicating your time to keeping Citrus Heights beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next up, can I have Mr. Bill Shirley, please? Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Council members, my name is Bill Shirley, and I'm currently serving as Vice President of Chasen, but my remarks to the Council tonight are my own and do not represent the Board. Tonight, you have the responsibility and the authority to nominate candidates to serve on the Planning Commission. This should not be taken lightly. Your decisions should not be based on political motives, political favors, what is best for me, friendships or close working associates. Your decisions tonight should be based on who can best serve the city, the council and the planning commission. The city clearly states that there are three requirements to serve on the planning commission. Number one, desire. So we know that all the candidates that were interviewed have the desire to serve on the planning commission. Also states that they should have knowledge, but the question is what should that knowledge be? Should the nominee have spent, uh, need to spend extensive time, extensive time learning how to read site plans, job specifications, so they can better understand the packets of information sent to them by the planning department? Or should they at least have a basic knowledge of zoning ordinances and building codes? Should they be able to have the knowledge needed to ask intelligent questions concerning the information provided or just rubber stamp it? We have a good building department, a very good building department, but the Planning Commission should still be another set of eyes and ears reviewing their decisions concerning new development in the city. The Planning Commission should be able to question potential developers with a firm understanding of what they are proposing and how it will impact the city. The third uh, qualification the city states is experience. This should be, in my opinion, one of the main factors in your decision-making tonight. Has your nominee had experience working with the City of Citrus Heights or other city planning departments and commissions? Does it, your nominee have experience in site planning, urban development, architecture, as a developer, as a general contractor, in the construction trades, or as a civil, structural, or other engineering um, aspects that can concern when it comes to development? Or how does your nominee's work history and education help in providing them with the necessary tools to serve effectively on the Planning Commission? With sunrise tomorrow getting closer to finally starting, this is not the time for extensive on-the-job training for the new Planning Commissioners. Consider your nominees carefully and vote for what is best for the City of Citrus Heights. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shirley. And next have Natalie Price. All righty, can we hear me? Thank you, Mayor Schaefer, Vice Mayor Daniels, and Council ladies. 
It's good to see you this evening. My name is Natalie Price. I am Vice President of REACH, that is the Residence Empowerment Association of Citrus Heights, and I am currently President of Area 10, Sylvan Old Auburn Road Neighborhood Association. It is in that latter capacity that I am here this evening to share with council and our residents some of the important work that we do in our neighborhood association. Just by living in Citrus Heights, you are a member of a neighborhood area. You don't pay any dues, you just are. And it's a beautiful opportunity to make a difference in our communities and in the lives of our neighbors. For SOAR, this is about our 10th year partnering with Meals on Wheels to deliver shelf-stable food, warm blankets, and other necessities, such as flashlights for the current power outages, gloves, hats, lotion, antibiotic ointment, band-aids, envelopes, pens, notepads, and more. I've created a short video to show council the work that I did this winter with Dr. Jana Karpinski-Costa, we're hoping the audio is participating. Here we are. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light Next year all our troubles will be out of sight Have yourself a merry little Christmas Make the Yuletide Next year all our troubles will be miles away Once again as in olden days Happy golden days of yours Until then, we'll have to muddle through somehow. So have yourself a merry little Christmas The most important part of this project is time. We don't show up and drop boxes on a porch. We don't mail them gift cards. We spend time with each resident. This year it was 12 individuals that had about 20 to 30 minutes apiece of interaction. And the number one thing we hear from our senior residents is we're lonely. So we make interactions. We get our neighbors connected with other community members and card groups and local organizations. And we get the Board of Supervisors connected with Meals on Wheels so that our congregate meals can come back to Citrus Heights. Being part of your neighborhood association does a lot more than just bring you to people. It brings all the people together. Thank you. Can I comment? 
I didn't see the video before you made it, Natalie, and it's beautiful. Thank you. All right. Next, can we have Al Fox, Albert Fox, to the podium, please? Good evening, Council. I appear you tonight as a member of the uh, Citrus Heights Police Department Foundation and on behalf of our Police Department Honor Guard. Our Honor Guard members represent our city and our police department in several functions, from celebrations to memorial events. They also represent our city at the National Police Memorial in Washington, D.C. during Law Enforcement Appreciation Week. To support these team members, I am proud to announce that they have now have a beautiful challenge coin that has been made for use as a fundraiser uh, by the department and by the Honor Guard. They are just fresh off the press. They are $20 each, and they are available. Commander Russo is with us tonight. Uh, he has several of these coins available for sale if you are interested. However, I uh, would like to take this time to encourage, as a member of our foundation, to encourage members of the community to support our Honor Guard by purchasing the uh, foundation or the uh, Honor Guard Challenge coin because this is the way they earn the money to pay for the events that are not paid for through city funds, taxpayer money, but is actually built and made, or excuse me, is actually um, received by the uh, efforts of the police department personnel and the Honor Guard staff. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Fox. <laughs> Next, may I have uh, Karen DeMarco, please. going to be reading from my phone my message good evening old and new members of the council my name is Karen DeMarco I'm a resident in Citrus Heights now for 17 years thank you for hearing me tonight I wanted to speak about the new Sunrise Marketplace I think it's possibly the great greatest thing to happen to Citrus Heights since incorporating I'm excited about it and what it holds for my children's futures but I'm here this evening for the first time because of my concerns for Antelope Road this is one of the main thoroughfares into our city leading straight to Sunrise Avenue. I have to say, Antelope Road from our 80 on-ramp to Sunrise is pretty gross looking. I can't say that I'm proud to drive down this stretch of road when I bring relatives to visit from the airport. So my property in particular lies between Auburn and Mar Mariposa, where the rear of it is on Antelope Road. I love my property and I spend many hours year-round on it. So first, now that we finally had some good rain, uh, it's pretty clear to myself and my surrounding neighbors that the drainage is lacking in this area. And second, the increasing traffic is so loud that it's becoming unpleasant just to be in my backyard. Uh, listening to an audiobook piped into my ears has become, uh, it has to be so loud to hear over that traffic that I'm probably injuring my ears. Also, lingering smell of fumes and exhaust is fairly sickening on a daily basis. And third, the speeding. Uh, when I hear screeching car tires, I move very quickly away from my fence. Uh, and I've told my children if they hear screeching to run. Um, I know there's been many attempts just in the last year alone to try to slow the traffic from placement of a no red light, uh, no turn on red sign to reflective light signals to added LED lights, which nobody told me about and shine directly in my bedroom window. <laughs> I do appreciate somebody trying to slow this traffic down. Thank you for that. But this has not worked, as there's been yet another accident onto my property just last week. So that is another prompt for why I'm addressing you this evening. Um, it is my opinion that one of the reasons why people drive so fast through this stretch of Antelope Road is because it's just ugly. They're trying to get through it as quick, quick as they can. Um, now I'd like to mention that there is a decent area on our road. It is a small development where Town Hall was considered to be. This is the nicest little area on Antelope Road. It has sound walls, it has drainage, it has sidewalks. It's lovely. I wish my frontage looked like that uh, development. Uh, if it did, we might slow down and smell their roses on the way to Sunrise Marketplace. So yes, I'm sure it's all code for the development, um, but those new codes to the sidewalk do nothing. It leads to junk ditches and a very scary bike lane. Uh, which I personally never use because of the dangers. In the meantime, we're spending a lot of time and money to beautify the Sunrise Marketplace uh, when the main entrance is to the city has its fences falling down, 
garbage stuck in the gutters, weed overgrowth, water puddling, noise, and smell. It's a blur to those speeding by, mere ongoing but worsening disturbances for us neighbors, but quite frankly, the Antelope Corridor is an embarrassment for all of us who call Citrus Heights our home. So I urge you to take a closer look at this stretch of Antelope Road. I urge that it be a priority over other potential projects. It would be a very important strategy to include in the Sunrise Tomorrow plan to improve overall beautification, take more pride to the entrance of our Sunrise Tomorrow. Thank you for your thoughtful time and consideration. Have a good evening. Thank you. And finally, uh, Mr. John Kane. Council and esteemed city staff. I just want to circle back to December. Um, first time, second time speaking before the council, I was nervous. I didn't know how long I had. And I want to circle back to the suggestion I had that the city begin looking at the possibility of creating our own school district. Like millions of parents around the country that are passionately involved in our children's lives, we have become more and more deeply and gravely concerned about the quality of education and safety of our children that attend our public schools. Council members, history shows that children are our future. So I'm not sure if there's a bigger priority than addressing the future of the children that call Citrus Heights their home. As you know, our city has a long history of knowing and understanding that when it comes to issues and services impacting local residents, decisions are best made at a local level. For example, I think Almost everyone I know is grateful that they did not have to go to the county to fill their sandbags the past couple of weeks. Solid roots and local decision making. We started our own fire department. We built the first school in the area. We began our own ambulance service. We founded our own city. We started our own police department. Why? Because history proves that these kinds of services are best done at the local level with local guidance and local oversight. Now, education. Stand outside Walmart on Auburn Boulevard and survey parents and ask them what two things are on your mind about public education and going to school. They're going to tell you their children's safety, and little did I know that the district is here to talk about school safety. Safety in the schools and the quality and content of what they're learning in school. So what about the safety of the children in the 17 public schools located in our city? I've been shocked to go past schools in our city that have security fencing, but wide open gates. Some with classrooms less than 30 feet from those open gates. Some schools with four foot chain link fences down their fields with the classrooms right there. What do we always hear? We never thought it would happen here. What about the quality of education being offered in our city schools? Just in my zip code alone, 95621, San Juan students have an average math proficiency, please pay attention to this number, of 17%. A reading proficiency score of 42%, all far below the good schools in our country. The high schools in my zip code have an average ranking of three out of 10, which is in the bottom 50% of California high schools, which happen to be among the worst in the country. And according to San Juan's own statistics, 44% of the students in San Juan schools are below average in the key subjects of math, science, and reading. Now, what is the result of this kind of academic record. Round numbers. 5,700 of the 19,000 school-age students in our city attend our 17 public schools. Let me repeat that statistic. Just 30% of the school-age children that live in Citrus Heights attend public school, and I'm sorry to say, 
that I'm part of the 70% that chose not to send them to our schools? Why are we paying taxes for schools that we don't even send our children to? And there's another thing I could get into their budget that year after year, they don't live within their means. The most recent bond measure was $750 million. So, can you only imagine what a local, parent-involved, education-focused, safety-conscious, fiscally responsible Citrus Heights School District could do with $247 million a year? Solid roots. It was time for a local school in our area in the late 1800s. New growth. It's time to look into creating a school board to oversee the 17 schools in our district. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kane. Uh, do we have, uh, we have a, another written comment, correct? Yes, I have one written comment, and the written comment is from Peter Ho, and he states, My Citrus Heights home has been health safety receivership for 20 months since April 2021. The receivership was obtained unlawfully and abusively. I want to address the council so they are aware of the situation and criminal misconduct I have been up against. I want to save my home and not lose it unjustly and abusively due to unreasonable unlawful crimes committed against me. Looking for further discussion, assistance, and resolution to end wrongful receivership caused by abusive characters. And that, that concludes the public comment that I have. Thank you very much. We have the next item, please. Next item is consent calendar items six, seven, eight, and nine. Pull number eight, please. We uh, pull number eight. I have a motion for accepting uh, six, seven, and nine, please. So moved. We have a second. Second. Okay. So we have a move. So moved and second by Daniels. Middleton. Can I have a, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, motion passes. Let's go back to, uh, to item eight. Uh, what are your concerns, Mr. Oh, I just want, uh, I, I'd like to, to make sure that the public knows that we do something else besides show up here uh, twice a month on Thursday nights and, uh, and, and, and you know, stick around for maybe a couple of hours. Um, we also sit on regional boards, and we represent the interest of our residents on those regional boards. And so I don't need an extensive reading. I would just like um, if we could read off who uh, it is going to be on each of these boards, these regional boards. Um, sure, I'm happy to do that. Okay. <laughs> so we have the Sacramento Metropolitan Cable Television Commission. The appointment would be... Councilmember Middleton and Councilmember Lopez Taff is the alternate. We have the Sacramento Public Library Authority. Councilmember Lopez Taff is the appointment with Councilmember Middleton as the alternate. We have the Sacramento Area Sewer District with Councilmember Karpinski Costa as the appointment and Vice Mayor Daniels as the alternate. We have the Sacramento Regional County Sanitation District with Vice Mayor Daniels as the appointment and Councilmember Karpinski Costa as the alternate. We have the Sacramento Transportation Authority with Councilmember Karpinski Costa as the appointment and Vice Mayor Daniels as the alternate. We have the Sacramento Area Council of Governments with Mayor Schaefer as the appointment and Councilmember Middleton as the alternate. And then the Regional Transit uh, Board with Vice Mayor Daniels as the appointment and Mayor Schaefer as the alternate. The Sacramento Metropolitan Air Quality Management District. We have Vice Mayor Daniels as the appointment and Council Member Middleton as the alternate. And then lastly is the Sacramento Steps Forward Homeless Policy Council. We have Council Member Lopez Taff as the appointment and Council Member Middleton as the alternate. Were you also the additional appointments? Do you want me to read those as well? You mean low, it, the, in house ones? Mm -hmm. No, it's fine. Okay. Um, those come up later, right? Anyway, it's part of this. Uh, are you okay. for the uh, city council two by two ad hoc committee? Yeah, go ahead and read those. Quality, Why not? Quality of life. That's what I meant. Sorry. So the city council has um, appointments to liaisons to local entities. We have an education and community program city council two by two committee with council member or vice mayor Daniels and council member Lopez Taff. 
We have a Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District two by two um, committee with Councilmember Lopez Taff and Councilmember Middleton. Uh, liaison to the Sunrise Marketplace is Vice Mayor Daniels and Councilmember Lopez Taff. And then finally, a, a Finance Administration City Council ad hoc subcommittee with Vice Mayor Daniels and Councilmember Karpinski Costa. And Quality of Life City Council ad hoc subcommittee with Mayor Schaefer and Councilmember Karpinski Costa. Thank you very much. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and move that item. Do we have a second? Second. I was uh, a, so that's a, a, a motion by Daniels, a second by Jane, uh, by uh, Council Member Taft. Uh, can I have a vote, please? Uh, aye. Aye. All in favor? Aye. Okay, motion passes. Next item, please. Next item is regular calendar, item number 10. The subject is city board and commission appointments, and the following is recommended. Council members um, Lopez Taff, Karpinski Costa, and Middleton nominate one regular member to serve on the planning commission. Um, Vice Mayor Daniels to nominate one regular member to fill an unexpired term on the planning commission. And then the City Council, by majority of vote, appoint individuals to the remaining at-large appointments to the Planning Commission and Construction Board of Appeals. Good evening, Council Members, Mayor Haley Reed, Management Analyst with the City Clerk's Office. Several Planning Commission and Construction Board of Appeals appointments are expired or vacant. The City accepted applications from November 1st through December 16th and received a total of 15 applications, three of which applied for both the Planning Commission and the Construction Board of Appeals. Tonight, there are a total of six appointments to be made to the Planning Commission, three regular member appointments to be nominated by Council Members Taft, Karpinski Costa, and Middleton, one regular member unexpired term to be nominated by Vice Mayor Daniels, and two at-large appointments. Additionally, there are two at-large appointments to be made to the Construction Board of Appeals. For Council's convenience, we have prepared the spreadsheet shown to record the appointments beginning with the Planning Commission and followed by the Construction Board of Appeals. It is Council Members Taft, Karpinski Costa, and Middleton, followed by Vice Mayor Daniels, announce their individual nominations, whose appointments are subject to, be rat to ratification by the Council. It is further recommended that each Council Member pro then provide two nominations for the two-year at-large appointments that will will be recorded on the screen for Council's consideration. All applicants have been invited to attend this evening's meeting, and some may wish to address the Council if you would like to take public comment prior to any action. I would like to take public comment prior to any action. Would any of the candidates like to come forward and speak? Seeing, okay. I don't know if we have any on Zoom. I do not have any on Zoom. Okay. Well, I, I've, uh, I've lived here for six years, and uh, I've been involved in urban issues for a very long time. The first time I was working with the Columbia, South Carolina Planning Commission, and it wound up being part of my master's thesis of uh, a grouping algorithm <laughs> and, 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 and of socioeconomic things, and it, and it helped, was, was used on the Planning Commission. At Harvard Business School, I... I, the uh, management of urban operations was the only course I had with George W. Bush as a classmate. Uh, I've been a CEO or COO of major corporations. I've been a, uh, a, 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 mem a NASDAQ member, and uh, I just love the city, and I think I, I could help it on, on an urban basis because, uh, again, I, I've, I've been basically doing cities here and in Bangalore, India, I was really part of our planning commission there. Our company was there for 14 years. Uh, and even they have lots of rules and regulations. But I just, I'm honored to be here. I was honored to run for city council. Congratulations, Mary Jane. And uh, I like living in Citrus. I just, that's all I got to say. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, before we move forward, I'd like to take a minute to, to, uh, to uh, number one, thank all of the 15 applicants that we have here. Uh, I reviewed all of the video, uh, very impressive group, um, and I can promise you there are a lot of tough decisions here. 
Um, even if you don't make the nomination, your city, city still needs you. We have neighborhoods that, have, uh, that are currently dormant uh, that we'd like to see reactivated. And I would really uh, implore you to get, uh, participate with your neighborhood association and really make your contribution uh, regardless of whether you, you uh, win an appointment tonight. So uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, Council Member Taft and uh, ask for her nomination for Planning Commission. I would like to nominate Marcel Flowers. Are we doing seconds now on that? Yes, we're yeah, doing seconds. I'll second that. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 I'd like to, uh, to ask uh, Jana Karpinski Costa for her uh, nomination. I am happy to nominate. Second that. In favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Next, I'd like to ask uh, Councilwoman Middleton for her nomination. Andrew Van Duker. Okay. In favor? Aye. 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 Congratulations, Van Duker. Uh, next, I'd like to uh, ask uh, Vice Mayor Daniels for his nomination. I'd like to nominate. Have a second? I'll second that. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, congratulations, Mayor no, Planning Commission. Okay, moving on, let's start with uh, do you care to uh, uh, Councilwoman Taft? Would you meet? Uh, a, and a large position. Yes, I would like to nominate Max Semenenko. And you have two. Can we if you would, it, it, one or two. Well, it's going to be a vote. Well, we have two oh. at large. Okay. Yeah, that would be my only nomination at this time. So let's go to. Uh, and uh, Jana Karpinski Costa. Two? We're doing two. Okay, I would like to nominate Max Simonenko and, and Jenna Moser. Mayor Daniels? I'd like to nominate Max Simonenko and. And I'd like to nominate, uh, let's go with uh, Alina. And Oleg Shishko. Mayor, could I make a selection? Yes, you may. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, yeah, I did. just. I'm yeah. Sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I would uh, like to select uh, Jenna uh, Moser. That's like it. a second. Okay. okay. Just the one. Okay, what's the next step? Did we want to go back to Jane? Did you want to do another? I'll nominate Oleg Shishko. Okay, that's two of each of us. What would be the next step here? At this point, it's open to the City Council to appoint um, to those. Okay, I'll uh, accept a motion to appoint. Max Semenenko and Oleg. Can we do two, Amy, with one motion? And Oleg Shishko to the. How many votes did Oleg get? All second. Oleg Shishko and Max Semenenko. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Here we are, Board of Board of Appeals. So can I uh, ask uh, Councilwoman Taff like to nominate? Who's this? Let's give Haley a moment to um, use her. Sure. Apologize. Scramble. Well, there's actually only if Max is on the planning commission, isn't there? Yeah, correct. That's correct. And we're looking here? Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's pretty academic, I think. Mm -hmm. So, Lance Gardner and Manuel Perez. So we, Can we just if, make a motion? Yes. Yes. I nominate Lance Gardner and Manuel Perez. Construct. 
Second. Okay, second. Okay, second by uh, Daniels and by Daniels, second by Lopez Taft. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, next item, please. Next item is regular calendar item number 11. The subject is a presentation by San Juan Unified School District regarding safe schools. And tonight we have Mike Jones with San Juan Unified School District here to give a presentation. Good evening, Mayor Schaefers. Hi, it's Mayor Daniels. Good to see you again, members of the council. What a great opportunity to be here tonight to talk to you, not only about our program of safe schools in the San Juan Unified School District, but on a night when some of our, several of our students are being honored for their artwork. And I always appreciate being yeah, at events like this when we have members of the community who have concerns about our school districts, our schools, and safety. So it's a great opportunity to be here on, on this night. So let me make sure we got things working here. Good. So tonight I've been asked to come and present what the Safe Schools program is for the San Juan Unified School District. Um, a little bit of history on it. San Juan Unified has actually had a Safe Schools program for a little over 30 years, about 34 years in total. In 2018, it switched to its current model. Prior to that, 2017 and prior, it was actually a contract agreement between the Sheriff's Department and the school district to employ off-duty peace officers daily to help serve the, the needs of the school district res with respect to crimes occurring on campus and emergency response. Within the city of Citrus Heights, we had an, we had an additional agreement with the Citrus Heights Police Department uh, to serve in the capacity of SROs, so school resource officers. That contract and agreement ended, I believe, in 2019-2020 school year was the last year we had SROs officially as part of the school district within Citrus Heights. In 2018, with this new model, we took things a different level and a different step for a number of reasons. Budgeting, in addition to community concern, as well as availability of law enforcement officers to serve in the capacity of off-duty within the Sheriff's Department, where the bulk of the schools are within our district. So for tonight's presentation to discuss this program, I want to start with our vision and mission statement so we have a clear understanding of what this program really is here and what it's about. The vision of the San Juan Unified School Safe School, excuse me, San Juan, San Juan Unified School District Safe School team is dedicated to improving campus safety and fostering an educational environment where students can learn, explore, and succeed academically. We utilize best practices and explore innovative methods to improve school safety in partnership with our internal district teams, external community organizations, other school safety resource groups. We strive to deliver these services professionally, recognizing who our customers are, demonstrating care, concern, and compassion for those we serve. The mission of this team is to support school administrators, educators, parents, and students to create safer school environments through planning, preparation, and prevention in response to recovery from disasters, criminal acts, and overall crisis situations. That's a tall order. So it takes a dedicated team to do these things, and I'll tell you, we do it very well with a very small group. Our team currently exists of myself as the director, one lead supervising uh, specialist who acts as the daily team supervisor, eight community uh, safety specialists, and one safe routes to school specialist. It's important to note that the safe routes to school specialist is currently a grant funded position under the Active Transportation Program grant and serves 14 schools within the unincorporated area as well as several schools within Citrus Heights, primarily along the carriage Lopi Lane Drive area. Oops, excuse me. San Juan Unified Safe Schools Program serves basically 12 uh, student uh, sites here within Citrus Heights, six elementary schools, three K through eights, one middle school, two high schools, and one adult education site, which is Sunrise Tech or the corner of Sunrise. Our population uh, student base is about 5,600, and that's rounded down by about 100 or so. And our staff is, again, about 300 personnel within that, those school areas. The objectives of this program are here to uh, help support the development of comprehensive school safety plans, which are state mandated to be updated annually, uh, to deliver and uh, basically conduct assessments for both school safety and vulnerability, as well as develop emergency procedures in response to drills at all sites. The team provides critical support to threat assessments, both behavioral threat assessments as well as uh, actual school threats of violence, critical incident management, 
we liaison with our local law enforcement uh, and first responders. And we also develop individual student safety plans related to individual education plans for our students, bullying, and other personal or family events that require attention. In addition to that, the team responds to assist with student behavioral crisis, violations of rules and policies occurring on campus, and disruptions affecting the overall safety of the site. Our community safety specialists. It's important to know what they aren't as well as what they are. First of all, our safety specialists security. They are not law enforcement and they're not armed. On a daily basis, they appear no differently than I am in front of you today. Apollo identifying themselves as a safe member of the Safe Schools team with a San Juan logo, dressed casually, comfortably, so we're approachable and able to work with groups comfortably. However, they are highly trained. They all have expertise in school emergency response procedures, active threat response, critical incident management and communication, the federal ICS and state SIMS systems, crisis communication and de-escalation skills, behavioral threat assessment, therapeutic crisis interventions, which is specifically used in our special education uh, world, crime prevention through vulnerability and safety assessments, as well as mandated reports. Generally speaking, our safety specialists are assigned to zones, anchored by a high school with their feeder schools moving forward. Citrus Heights is a little bit different in the fact that we wanted to assign a primary specialist to this area. So we have a lead safety specialist who is supported by two others as, as a support to cover all 12 school sites in this area. ships in the district to help conduct our services and help ensure that we're out there uh, really helping keep our campuses safe is we work very effectively with our internal communications team they really are the kind of the backbone of our emergency messaging when incidents are going out to, to inform not only the district, staff, personnel, but also students and members of our community of what's happening. Uh, our facilities team, that was a huge issue, especially during the storms periods. I will tell you that uh, beginning, I have to uh, put out a huge kudos to our uh, facilities and maintenance and operations teams who began Friday evening and worked non hours around the clock, clearing our were prepared and ready for student safety to return this past Tuesday. So they, it was a Herculean effort and they were absolutely outstanding. We work very closely with our prevention services groups, uh, specifically in the areas of anti-bullying, substance abuse, as well as student assistance programs there to help provide those supports needed so that they can be effective learners on our campus in that state. As well as our family and community engagement team, our base unit, problem resolution and uh, mediation unit for, for the district. Our partnerships with law enforcement are incredibly important. Um, specifically here in Citrus Heights, I cannot stress how appreciative we are of the response relationships we share with Chief Turcott and his They have been outstanding these last several years. Uh, there have been a number of incidents uh, which we have worked very collaboratively, very quickly to respond to threats of violence, you know, whether posted through social media or through the campus, very effectively to alleviate those concerns and help provide that sense of safety back to the campus. We partner to investigate direct threats, as I mentioned, uh, conduct behavioral threat assessments, as well as address crimes. I want to touch just a moment uh, on this behavioral threat assessment. Behavioral threat assessment is relatively new to this district, um, as well as a districts kind of across the nation. Behavioral threat assessment really is a collaborative group effort where we bring together experts, mental health professionals, social workers, counselors, school administrators, teachers, law enforcement, and safety specialists to work as a group to actually investigate and assess concerns that are brought forward, whether they be uh, about uh, a threat to themselves, whether somebody's worried that someone's going to hurt themselves, whether somebody is worried that they are uh, on a pathway of violence to hurting someone else. This group can work collaboratively to investigate the level of that threat and assess an appropriate response and intervention tactics. I do truly believe that most acts of school violence are preventable, and this is one of the key elements there to help uh, really bring that forward. This year, specifically on the heels of some of the more horrific uh, school shootings we've had across the nation, we have embarked upon a, uh, a site safety and vulnerability assessment procedure. Every one of our school sites is going, yeah, has been assessed. As of today's date, all of our high schools, all of our middle schools, and all of our K-8s have been fully completed. Our elementary school sites have been completed partially, 
with a full completion of those elementary sites by March 1 coming forward. These assessments focus on four primary areas, school and surrounding community crime statistics to see what's going on around that campus, what's impacting it both on and off as far as its overall safety, physical security and vulnerability. This is that site security. This is the access. How easy it is for people to come onto our campuses. Uh, do they have to check in? Are they seen? Is there, is there sufficient staffing? What is the facility layout like? What's, uh, what do we need to change practice-wise, perhaps increase things as well as physical security, gating, door locks, uh, camera systems and such. Our planning, training, and existing practices, that's staff-oriented. How effective are we at actually preparing them for emergencies? And the last part is school culture and environment. School culture environment is a key aspect as well because we want to know how comfortable our students are on those campuses to be able to report issues they're concerned about. Are they being bullied? Do they see that happening? Do they have concerns about somebody else? Do they have trusted people on that campus they can come and talk to and report those things to? In addition to that, is there a resource where our community can report those events? I'm happy to say we do have those on all campuses, including both online. People can report anonymously as well as known. So it's a very effective system there for us. Some of the outcomes of the assessments. So quickly, we began to see themes emerge. And a lot of that, as mentioned before, has to do with perimeter and access control to our campuses. Recognizing that a significant number of our schools in this district are 50, 60 years old, these schools were built to be part of the community. They were built to be open and welcoming and to have those easements of use to be really an extension of that existing community it deserves. Today, we have to balance that access as well as security. So we're moving forward with some, some improvements. The four primary areas we are moving forward to improve are fencing and gating to create single points of entry on every single campus. That is not necessarily boundary fencing, which is that exterior out, maybe perhaps by the street or the sidewalk fencing. This is that core internal fencing that eliminates a person from coming on campus with access to those classrooms without having to first go through an office and should be checked in. So the second part is standardized classroom locks. Again, because of the construction through our, our school sites, we have very old schools and we have brand new schools. We are working to cons make consistent locks um, uh, throughout our district where every door can be locked from the inside without a key, but still be accessed externally through a key lock. That would allow anyone, staff, parent, or students in the event of an emergency to secure their space and become safer without the need to have to find that key to lock that door. But we can still access that room without being inhibited. The administration and office access control, this is where our office, in any emergency, our office staff really becomes that initial management team. We want them to be safe. We want them to be able to control that access point, whether it be operating in an environment where the door is open and accessible and they can lock it electronically or they choose to do the reverse and manually unlock it electronically and allow people in. That's a matter of practice. The fact that we are going to develop a system and input those, those devices to where we can control that access. And the last part is going to be improved signage and pathway marking. This is very important for our first responders. Right now, coming onto our campus in an emergency, it is often difficult to find a location of where you need to go to find that pathway of what building is marked building H. We're going to be going through and ensuring that all of our buildings are clearly marked, clearly identified, and the signage is not only uh, for building markings, but also for the communities coming on. Clearly posted boundaries, clearly posted expectations of behavior, clearly expect, uh, posted expectations of what is allowable items on campus and not on campus. The requirement to actually have to check into the office in violation of a lot if they don't so that we can pursue those persons who are on our campus without permission. This project uh, is really ongoing, effective immediately. Now it's timeline as far as completion, I can't present to you today because there are components of this that are still gonna be out for actual design. Uh, many of our campuses are currently under construction or have recently been constructed. They, are met, they have already met a significant number of these, these, these foundational aspects. As we move forward, we're prioritizing additional funds to ensure that we've earmarked $10 million from existing bond monies to augment current facility improvement funds for those projects that are currently existing to ensure that those four categories that I've just identified do get completed. 
that we can't actually meet that standard. Uh, our facilities team is going through and doing that design process uh, for those campuses that have minimal or no fencing and gates on those perimeter things, on those uh, internal core perimeter areas. That is going to be some time in design, some time in, in bidding process to meet all the aspects of code enforcement, ADA compliance, as well as fire compliance. Our signage and pathway, as well as door locks, those are being done as we speak. So those are already in the, uh, in the works and moving forward with it. The one thing I would like to you know, point out is how proud we are of this team and its current makeup, uh, its model. It is being used across the state, and I have been in consultation with many districts, uh, even outside of California, who have called to inquire because they've got wind of what we're doing here. Of note, Folsom Cordova Unified and Atomas districts have both recently adopted models to mirror what we're doing here as far as our methods go. So with that, I want to be able to open up to you to answer any questions I possibly can today, or at least be able to take back and get and be able to respond to you in the future if I can't answer tonight. Questions from council members? Uh, Dr. Jana Karpinski Casso. How Thank many you. of the schools in, in Citrus Heights are in the category that you said you're going to have to go out to contract for fencing and, and that? How, how many of the schools need? So, in, to fencing? a small degree, each of them. Schools like Woodside K-8 has a significant amount of internal fencing already existing, but their gating system uh, doesn't auto-close, doesn't have the, the security features that we want to see there to allow that, that gate to automatically close during the course of the school day and still allow for that emergency exit and even throughput at the end of the day for students to be dismissed, but to be able to control to where it's not a point of access coming in. So there's components. Each school's going to be a little bit different. So every school, to some degree, is going to be going through some bit of design, whether it be an update of gating, whether it be an, a, a completion of fencing. Have you got a money estimate of what it's going to cost just to provide you know, campus security? Camp, uh, we're not providing well, it meant, campus meant security. The fencing, the physical barriers. Uh, I don't have those figures today. That, that's going to be our facilities team as, as they go through and actually plot the, the overall design for those. All set? Okay. Uh, Council Member Taft, questions? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Jones, for um, coming out and presenting to us tonight. Question for you, statistics. In the 21-22 school year, how many incidents were in the boundaries of Citrus Heights schools? Well... And I know there's many <laughs> categories, but... There's it, a number of categories. I'm not sure... Uh, I would not be able to provide that specific answer for you today, not knowing the direct category you may want, mm. um, but I would be happy to report back to you. Thank you. Yeah. Vice Mayor? Sure. Thank you. Um, first thing I want to say is um, thank you, Mike, for being here. Um, you know, having known you for over 30 years, I think, um, you know, I applaud the leadership of the district in choosing you um, and your predecessor, Bob Erickson, uh, to lead. Um, you both are, are um, extremely dedicated, and uh, I know that they made wise decisions there. Um, and a lot of that is because of your experience. I, I really greatly appreciate your experience, your pre previous experience with the Sheriff's Department and what that allowed you to bring to that team. Um, I, I have, uh, you said in 2018, uh, you went away from the LEO, uh, the law enforcement officer model, and went with the uh, school safety officer uh, model, uh, n civilian model, we'll call it maybe. Um, was there a reason for that? Do you know? Uh, th there was a number of reasons, some being the inability of the Sheriff's Department to maintain adequate daily staffing through the off-duty program. Again, that was an off-duty contract. So these were not officers that were assigned on a daily basis as part of their normal daily duties. This was on their days off. So it was difficulty to field the staffing for it each day, in addition to the cost itself. So with low staffing numbers and increased costs, it, the district made the choice to, to move to a model they could support and provide the services really where uh, the district was going to get its biggest bang for its buck, which is in that support, planning, prevention, and resource areas. And then on that cost uh, angle, um, you'll impress me a lot if you know this. Do you know the actual budget of the Safe Schools program? Uh, off the top of my head today, as far as our, our current Which program. Which annual as a whole, budget is for the program? It's a little over, 
you know what, I, I'm going to be hesitant because I might be incorrect with it. So I'd be, I'd be happy to report that back whether you want it. And I don't mean to put you on the spot even, because if yeah. people ask me these things, I go like, uh, there's too many numbers for me to remember. There's, yeah, uh, I, I don't want to be incorrect with it. So, and, I, and the other follow-up was I'm, I was wondering how much of the school budget, the district budget, they dedicate to the safe school budget, you know. And so um, it'd be good to have those numbers uh, so that we can have perspective of, of the level of uh, you know, dedication the district puts into the safe schools program, money-wise, money-wise. I'm very pleased to hear you talk about that. Um, there is movement forward for uh, improving fencing and gating. Um, I think that's critical. You've got to harden the target, and um, it, it saddens me that uh, 200 days after Uvalde, uh, I still have to take my daughter to school and drop her off with a gate that's wide open 25, 50 feet from her classroom that says this gate shall not be closed during school hours. It just baffles me beyond, you know, again, we're 200 days past and we still have this wide open target. Um, but um, do you know, um, you did talk about some design and uh, movement with that. Has there been any um, physical hardening of schools in Citrus Heights uh, over the last 200 days? Over the last 200 days? Yeah. So with the improvements, so physical hardening consists in many ways. The change of a door lock is a hardening. And I'm that talking has fencing and gating then. Like fencing and gating, outside of existing projects, no. Uh, outside of existing projects that, have exi you know, that are ongoing, uh, including those modifications that have occurred to sites such as San Juan High School, uh, where they have had ongoing construction projects that have recently completed, including new fencing areas around those. So within the last 200 days, uh, I can't think of anything on top of my head specifically, but again, I'd have to consult our facilities team to see what is going on behind the scenes that they're looking at doing. And then um, I'm going to go back to, again, your leadership and why I appreciate it so much, is, and mainly your law enforcement background. Your current safety specialists that you have, um, are they required to have any kind of law enforcement background? Not required to, but it is highly desirable and we lean towards that. Of the eight safety specialists, Six of them are former law enforcement and or probation officers. Uh, one of them, although not uh, a law enforcement officer, did complete a law enforcement academy as well as worked for Los Rios Community uh, Police Department in a non-sworn position. And then the, our, our final eighth uh, safety specialist uh, served as a campus security officer previously. Um, and is there any um, thought of going back then or to a requirement of a law enforcement officer um, instead of a civilian type position. Is there any thought of doing that within the safe schools program? Of moving to hiring law enforcement? Yeah, or going back to contracting or even forming its own police department. No. Okay. Um, I think that's it. Yep, that's it for now. Then. Great. So I have a, just a really quick short question because I'm going to get a little more specific on the kinds of incidents that I'm interested in. And I would like to know over the last, uh, and I, I realize you're probably gonna have to come back to me with this number, uh, but over the next, uh, over the last 60 months, I'd like to know how many incidents involving firearms, weapons, explosives, or arson materials have been uh, discovered on the, have been created on the, on, on the Citrus Heights campus. I'm just only specifically looking for the Citrus Heights campuses where you have 5,600 students. Um, uh, and uh, I can, I would just like to know what that, num what that number looks like. I can tell you it's very, very low, but I'll get that specific okay. number to you. Great. Very low if it exists at all. Okay. Well, that's all I had. Next item. That's it. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Appreciate it. The next item is uh, regular calendar item number 12. The subject is police officers assigned to schools discussion. The recommendation is to receive staff presentation and prov provide further direction if needed. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor, members of council. Alex Turcotte, Chief of Police. Uh, with me tonight is Senior Management Analyst Cassandra Kinan, which is a new thing to say. And it's her new name, so uh, welcome and uh, congratulations to her on her nuptials. So uh, tonight we're here to discuss um, armed police officers in school campuses. So like Director Jones had discussed, uh, last year saw a number of very tragic incidents across the country. Um, our jurisdiction, much like 
a lot of members in the, in the nation, you know, called to question what does our safety model look like? You know, what can we do to better take care of children in our schools? Um, in July of 2022, I presented to council a basic overview of our current methodology with the police department as well as our partnership with Safe Schools. Tonight you heard from Safe Schools on their current project and what they, were, uh, what they do to help proactively prevent threats at the schools. Um, in October of 2022, the conversation continued where council, uh, one of the ideas that was thrown around was having armed officers at each school. Uh, council asked that we take a look at what the initial cost and overview would be, the initial analysis to place an armed uh, police officer in each of our 12 Citrus Heights campuses. And we're asked to return today with that particular number. So the staff report in front of you reflects high level initial analysis. It is not a recommendation or an implementation plan. It's but a basic estimate overview just to simply answer that question. And then we would, we would move on from there. So to dive into that a little bit as determined for the 12 campuses, that would take a total approximately 15 additional employees. That would be the 12 line level officers, administrative support and supervision. That would also come with the equipment needs to outfit those employees and training and operational concerns there. Um, one item to note is that while the campuses are within our jurisdiction, currently our public schools are part of the San Juan Unified School District and they, they technically have jurisdiction over their schools and are a major stakeholder in security of their schools and would be at a place, would be have a place at the table with this discussion. Again, this is an informational item only. No specific, no specific action is required. We're going into the fiscal impact. Again, high level evaluation. Um, just taking a look at the initial impact. It appears that approximately $1.8 million would be needed to stand up the equipment and materials um, to field that level of employee. And then an ongoing cost of $2.58 million for annual costs at the current salary range. Um, that includes $2.23 million of annual operating costs and $347 for uniforms, equipment, and the like. Um, excuse me, $2.23 for salary and then operating cost of 347 per year. Um, on the staff report, exhibit one itemizes the estimates of where we came up with those numbers. Again, that is a, that is a thumbnail of just answering the question. If we would look to go forward with a project, we'd have to dive deeper into that. There might be some unattended costs and there might be some other um, options that we could pursue to mitigate some of those costs, if you will. With that, are there any questions from council? Right. Any questions from council? Jane? Dr. Jana? Any questions? Yeah, uh, just a few over the information that you provided on yes, employee costs. Um, one of them included uh, uh, the addition of a CSO. Mm -hmm. um, I found that kind of surprising. Can you explain the uh, reasoning behind putting a CSO in that position? Yeah, that comes from the, the expertise of our particular field. It looks like, you know, we have our, our sworn officers that do an excellent job, but really um, having our professional partners from support role and administration to lean on has become a crucial resource. So for instance, most of our patrol teams also have a CSO alongside. So when looking and evaluating this, there is an administrative function that doesn't necessarily need a police officer, but would need some law enforcement expertise. Um, we looked at accomplishing that with a program assistant or management analyst, but felt that a CSO would be the best of both worlds because not only could they help with the administrative duties, but they also within their job spec can do field operations like presentations, DARE programs, safe schools and the like. So it really would be a added benefit to be a force multiplier in that, in that realm, if you will. And then also um, on the equipment side, you listed, I think it was 15 vehicles at $90,000 each, if I'm remembering right. Yeah, cars are expensive. That's the full buildup of a <laughs> yes, patrol car, yeah. Is that uh, assuming that you would purchase 15 vehicles at that price? Yes. Okay, so um, uh, again, that's not a requirement. Obviously, we would not put uh, dilapidated cars at these schools. A car is not even a requirement necessarily. I think it's a, the right thing to do, but it's not necessarily a requirement to do this. Um, but
but it's certainly not a requirement that we purchase new vehicles for this uh, um, idea, right? Yeah, there are several different options in here that we could we could go through and discuss. What we wanted to do was, all things being equal, here's what a full loadout looks like, and then we can we could mitigate or flex from there. Okay, and then. Um, I think you said 2.58 million as an ongoing number uh, for that plan, with the number of employees you mentioned, and number of cars and all of that. We would need 2.58 million ongoing to keep the program going. Yes, sir. And so that also, again, assumes some of those things that could be flexible um, as to whether or not we would either do them or, or at that cost, correct? Right, and it's also considering today's cost. So on a go forward, you would also have the... Uh, you know, the inflationary issues with that as well. Okay, I, I think that's my questions for now. Okay. okay. Just a point of uh, clarification. Mm -hmm. It doesn't include any pension liabilities or anything? It does like not. That. Okay. Or logistical um, building infrastructure offices or what so might So retrofitting the, the, the police department. Right, or other capacities for like human resources or finance or those things. But those, those would be things we would have to vet out if we wanted to look further into implementing. So you're just telling me it's gonna get more and more expensive? Depending on which options uh, you choose. Yes. It is Thank a choose-your-own-adventure type of thing. Well, it, it, it's a good point, but, but also it goes to, again, you know, what would the model be? I, I mean, I, I just personally, I would envision a, a workforce that doesn't come to the police station to start their day. They, they start their day at the school, um, and that there's no lag time between when they started their day and getting to their assignment. Um, you know, there may be a time or whatever when there's a requirement that they do come in and start or whatever, have some sort of level of briefing. But I don't see a necessarily a need for them to come to the department headquarters and then go from there. And the, the car issue is, an, is a concern, obviously. What do we do with the cars then and that kind of thing? But, you know, when we get into, like you said, the deeper into the weeds and are we going to have to build another wing in the, in the police department or, or whatever, um, there are options in those areas too. I think, I think there's be. options at every Lots turn in this particular idea. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So um, I, I do have a uh, quick question here, and that is with, with regard to the uh, the current uh, police department, the, the actual building itself, are you completely utilizing every cubicle and space that's there? Uh, we are. We have moved to a bunk bed cubicle option that we're exploring for future <laughs> personnel build-out. Um, uh, now, we have... We have great equipment and adequate facilities currently, but we are probably at uh, capacity. Okay, thank you. But your office is still 3,000 square feet, though, right? So. <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually have a bunk bed in there. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for your report, Chief. We appreciate that. Thank Any you. other questions or comments from Council? Well, I would like to um, uh, suggest that we move forward with uh, examining um, funding sources. Uh, if we do decide to move forward with this, um, are we able to do that, Ryan, now, or are we just? What you can do is provide staff direction. We can't take a motion on anything. Right, right, but absolutely. I think that's kind of what you're getting at, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah just uh, that we move forward with uh, examining it further as to if we decided to go forward, what would be the options for funding sources and that kind of thing. I actually have a question just kind of prior to this. Um, I, I'm always interested in stats. So what are our statistics regarding our response? And, and it's very similar to the question I asked Mr. Jones. And uh, do we have any statistics about incidences at our schools that required our local police response or some um, enumer enumerated high casualty issues? So do we have any statistics that we can work from to really think through this amount of both staff and dollars? Well, I will tell you that thankfully we do not have a real world issue to draw statistics from. Um, <clears throat> what we do have is um, several training scenario type um, issues that we've gone through. There are at least two um, real world call for services that um, sounded like they may be something like that. I didn't bring the statistics with me, but when we when I was preparing our uh, presentation for council in July, I did look at that um, anecdotally just to see what response times were. Um, I was I was happy to note that the entire schools were able to get locked down and safely secured within 
single digit minutes. I think one was three minutes, one was five to six. We recently had an issue at one of our local high schools with a, uh, turned out to be a hoax, but with a threat of violence. Mm -hmm. And we were able to see that too. The one um, nice thing that we enjoy here in this region is um, a lot of close allied partners who also take um, youth safety very seriously. So in both of those instances, when we've called, we've had not only our own staff, but staff from the surrounding agencies here um, very quickly, very quickly to lock down. So um, thankfully, nothing real to report on the aftermath, but we have exercised our plan in a real world situation at least two to three times that I have record of, so. Thank you, Chief. Mm -hmm. I think that's a very good point, but I also it's all important to remember that we're looking at the preventative side, not just you know, what has happened, but what could happen. Sure. Um, and with the addition also of the, how does it benefit the, the city as a whole to have 12 police officers strategically placed throughout the city who can respond to something else in, in, a, in immediate need, if there is an immediate need uh, for that, um, those kind of things. And then ultimately, um, the, the hope that uh, the officer never has to have a negative or a reactive type of uh, action and that in the process that officer builds positive relationships with those kids that hopefully pay big dividends down the road um, when children or teenagers or, or whatever have to decide whether they're going to go one path or another path um, and maybe that positive relationship um, help them choose which path they, they would go on. So I think it's more than just looking at do we make the school safe. Uh, that's the big biggest part of it but I think it's very important to not miss the opportunity to do these other things also. Great. So um, do we have a consensus of the council? Do we want to uh, sort of move forward and look at, look at some of the more of the details here? Um, what do you think, Jana? Mr. Mayor, I, I just want to disagree ahead of time. I'm not sure we need to look at budgeting money as much as they need to look at fixing up their security of their campuses, which he could not name how many of our schools need fencing. And, you know, just to put a person in a building doesn't protect children when they have the obligation. To me, the school has the obligation to provide a safe campus. And if the speaker who was here was correct in his numbers, only 30% of the students in Citrus Heights attend schools in Citrus Heights. So they're outside of the city going to school somewhere unprotected. So I kind of don't want to spend money right now to, to look for money when I think that we need that the next move ought to be with their safe school program and see where they get with their program and how much they invest into our schools before we invest. Other than that. Yeah, I would like to echo that sentiment really to think about more collaborative ways that, and it sounds like we have a great collaborative partnership with safe schools and uh, Citrus Heights PD, so I'm, I'm not necessarily inclined to continue looking at what we can do to find money because they have such an effort already underway. Okay, so certainly my concern is as we crunch through all these numbers and we think about this and I think about Uvalde and what they were looking at, what, were, what, what did, before that shooting happened, before Sandy Hook happened, before all this, all these other shootings at the schools happened. Um, what, what, but if you ask them ahead, before that happened, what would their response be? And I'm sure they would say, oh yeah, we're good. And then we had a problem. So I would, I would certainly be much more proactive in, uh, in having too much security than not enough. Then, and, and again, I agree with, uh, Vice Mayor Daniels, uh, you know, an ounce of cure, uh, sorry, a, a, an ounce of prevention beats 10 pounds of cure. Um, because we're, if, as soon as we're reactive, it's almost too late to do anything. Um, one officer in one school, if that officer happens to be in the right spot at the right time, it's, look, it's, it shows a response, but it's not necessarily going to be an effective response. So uh, I, I, I do think that I, I do like what I heard from safe schools, that they are, it, it's a cultural, I, I'm gathering that it's a cultural 
a program that really is ingrained, and so you, you think that you would be able to identify uh, an internal threat, because let's face it, a lot of these, when you profile some of these shooters, you're looking at people that are that were bullied, that had all kinds of uh, flags that were ignored or missed uh, along the way, and those are areas, but I, I, I'm certainly inclined to say, I don't want to come back here uh, after the next shooting happened, say, yeah, we kind of looked at that, but yeah, we decided not to. Um, it really, uh, I just, I don't know how I could sleep at night if I didn't really take that seriously. So anyhow, that's all I have to comment on that. All right, next item, please. Thank you, Chief. Next item is department reports, and there are none. Next item is city manager items. Good evening, uh, Mayor Schaefer, Vice Mayor, Council members. You do have an update, and uh, you all kind of hit on it, I think, at the outset. What do they say? Uh, in like a lion, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, I guess, out like a lion, too. So we definitely had uh, quite a bit of uh, extreme weather uh, to finish the year out as well as to start our year. Uh, the good news is we're getting a lot of water as a result, but it certainly put a lot of service demands, and uh, we do have some stats here for you. I, I did want to just first off just really highlight our team. Uh, I was very impressed with the responsiveness, the teamwork, uh, how everybody pulled together and was looking out for one another, and lots of communication. Uh, that's the kind of work that people don't see when the team is, uh, you know, kind of really looking out for the best interests of the community. But, uh, for instance, I was at the communication center on um, on Sunday, what's after the big wind event, uh, and uh, we had really all departments uh, represent, represented or in communication as we were collaborating on how best to serve the community and how to respond to, uh, you know, some pretty extreme situations. Uh, as you can see, over the... Um, Last couple of weeks, there was 460 service response that were made to uh, GSD, lots of calls that came into the comm center as well. Um, that Our normal uh, average is about 75 calls per week. So you can see we're well above the, uh, the weekly average there. Uh, 335 of those calls were storm-related uh, since uh, December 30th. Uh, there were not all those calls are represented here, but if you to highlight, uh, 104 uh, downed or damaged trees. Uh, unfortunately, we lost some, some great trees uh, during this um, these storms here. Uh, we had 74 streets that were flooded and clogged drains. I'm going to say this on flooding. I was so impressed of going through the city on New Year's Eve and looking at our creeks. The creeks were at top of bank uh, for sure. But did not see, I, I know there was flooding out there on certain streets, but did not see widespread flooding that we've seen sometimes in the past. And this was a major event. Uh, so very happy that the storm drain uh, and creek maintenance programs that the city has really put a lot of focus on really paid off. And we didn't have the extreme uh, kind of flooding that we'd seen in the past. Uh, 30 down lines, and there was uh, lots of debris in the road, but uh, there was a lot of effort to get that cleared up quickly. If you drove around the perimeter of the city in some of our outlying areas, um, it took a while to get trees cleared. It took a while to get around. And, uh, you know, there's still that going on. I mean, we still have things that we're dealing with, but I'd say the response to clear the major roadways and get things opened up uh, for our residents and businesses are uh, just very impressive, and I can't thank our team enough. Um, we did, you can see here in the pictures at Rush Park, uh, you know, we, we definitely maxed out kind of our... Uh, our creek there and it uh, went over the uh, top of the bank, but it, it kind of the system worked, if you will, for a major flood uh, or major rain event rather. And then we've got our team that were uh, actively clearing drains to make sure our roadways were safe to travel. So uh, just, just a lot of work. Uh, appreciate all the residents that were reporting uh, incidents as well. So we could, I mean, we had proactively had our eyes out there with the team, but it's always helpful to hear from our residents. So, um, we can make sure that we're able to, you know, get to areas that we haven't seen yet. So uh, appreciate the team, appreciate the community, and, and how we all collectively responded to this storm. And uh, everybody stay safe out there. I know we've got some more rain on the way this coming week. And that concludes my updates. Can I ask a question? Thank you, sir. How did our homeless fare in those rain? Where did they go? 
did they do we have did we all did they all get shelter somehow or the county the county did have shelters uh, that were open available and there was a definitely with our navigator uh, staying in communication with our um, our unhoused population as well as our impact team uh, making sure that there's knowledge of where those uh, uh, shelters exist you know when you have major events like that there's a lot of displacement uh, of people that are unhoused um, and so certainly with our impact team our navigator we definitely uh, make sure that we're connecting with our unhoused community to ensure that they're aware of what services are available and we hope that they take those services thank you I wanted to also mention a great system that we have for notifying staff of issues that are going on and I used it over the storm season that we recently had see click fix and that worked so seamlessly I was very impressed with the fact that I not only easily made my um, observation report and uh, but it followed through with follow-up um, notifications to me and other notifications in my area. So I was very, very impressed with that. So I hope our, our residents really take advantage of See, Click, Fix, the app for Citrus Heights. It worked really wonderfully. So that's an app, right? It's an app, Correct. or do you, can you go to the website and just see, click, and fix? We, we have the See, Click, Fix app. We also have, you know, phone reporting. Uh, there's a text function. Uh, email we've got multiple ways to communicate and we've been really trying to put that out there on our social media channels on uh, having a communication uh, method that works for the user so we have lots of different streams and avenues for people to uh, go ahead and uh, report those issues we lost our street sign and I did call City Hall to the street signs gone so the wind took it somewhere well we definitely have a method to report that, and it sounds like you found one of those methods, and I'm, I'm sure our team is absolutely on it. I do the phone call. I don't know about apps. <laughs> okay. Next item, please. Next item is items requested by council members or future agenda items. Anybody? Okay, so I'll, I'll ask one of my council members to support me on this, a future agenda item. I am delighted to uh, hear that Reach is thinking about returning the um, uh, returning the potluck that we had for many years. Uh, what I'd last ask one of my council members to do is support a uh, an item, uh, an agenda item that would waive the um, fee from the community center for uh, a future uh, Reach potluck. Now that I'm on the quality of life committee, I'll support that for you. Mm -hmm. yep, great, thank you. And I have one more, and it's one we've revisited before, and that is I'd like to um, get one of my council members to support me in um, a, uh, bringing forward an agenda item that uh, calls for a uh, committee to examine uh, Citrus Heights, um, its own school district. I'd like to call this, uh, this committee CHECK, Citrus Heights Education Committee. Um, and uh, can I get a second? from any of my council members. I will second that. Thank you very much. With that, any other items? Okay, for, um, can I have the next item please? Um, there are no further items. Great, with that I will adjourn this uh, meeting at uh, 7.54. Thank you for coming.